Today we're going to work on one of our favorite types of content to do after a new CPU launch. And that's what we call a super tuned benchmark of two different CPUs. In this case, it's going to be the 10600K against the R55600X, the new AMD Zen 3 CPU. And these two are, they're both about $300. They're pretty close competitors. And in the review, the 5600X pretty much universally won. And the air quotes are there because, well, the degree to which it won really depended on the test. And some of them, like Red Dead 2, they were close enough at times that it might not matter. But there are other instances where the 5600X won by a large margin. So now we're going to do our best effort overclock without liquid nitrogen or anything crazy, just air cooling, to see how things do. Before that, this video is brought to you by Drop and the new Drop Enter mechanical keyboard. The Drop Enter 10 keyless mechanical keyboard uses an aluminum housing underside to provide rigidity when typing. And top side, it uses smooth gator on yellow or tactile Halo True switches. Drop offers this smaller keyboard in black, white, and two-tone black-green, and calls it a beginner mechanical keyboard for soon-to-be enthusiasts. Currently, Drop is offering the keyboard bundled with a PC37X headset, which is actually the main one we use in the office. Learn more at the link in the description below. So a couple things to go over. When I say air cooling here, all I really mean is air going through the cooler. It's a liquid cooler. We use the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 280 for all of our CPU tests that are desktop class. And then for HEDT parts like Threadripper and Intel HEDT, we use a 360 cooler. So we're using the same cooler for both. We are not using extreme cooling or really extreme overclocking methods of any kind. And the goal of this content is to do really a, a best effort sort of normal OC for CPU A versus CPU B. And for this, because you can always keep going down the rabbit hole for overclocking, switching out the different memory kits or whatever, uh, we set a time limit. So I personally did both the overclocks, so we had the same driver in the seat, so to speak, and I gave myself a time limit of six hours per CPU. I, I used the full six hours for each one. After six hours, whatever the tune was that I got, that was the one that we ran, because otherwise you'll just keep going forever, and then it's just an arms race against yourself, and that doesn't really make much sense. So that's what we did. The results were pretty damn good. The uh, There are some considerations here. So. For example, when we start talking about memory, the Intel CPU we got running at 4,000 megahertz with one of our good kits. We're working on getting some even better ones in for the future, but 4,000 megahertz for that. But we didn't run 4,000 for AMD because keep in mind that with AMD, maintaining a one-to-one -one or one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ideally of mem clock, u clock, and f clock is ideal. It's better than running, say, 4,000 megahertz mem or even 4,200 mem versus 1,900 megahertz f clock because you'd want 2,000 if you're doing 4,000 mem uh, or 2,100 if you're doing 4,200 mem. And if you can't maintain that ratio for performance in tests like these, like games, like non synthetic applications, you're almost always going to be better bringing down the memory to maintain one-to-one. -one. But that's all old content. We've talked about that in the past. So for AMD, we basically set the memory frequency contingent upon the F clock or the infinity fabric frequency that was attainable on our R55600X sample. As always, the quality of the infinity fabric overclocking, just like quality of all core overclocking, will vary unit to unit. And right now, there isn't a GSA issue where AMD thinks that later it might be able to get more people up to 2,000. But for today, for what's out there now, 1,900 is the max we can do on our 5600X. And I did try a lot of different techniques to try and even just get 1933, but it wasn't doable. So for the memory tuning, we didn't get too crazy. We obviously adjusted VDIM to support things. And then we also adjusted TRC, TWR, TCWL, TRFC, TRTP, TFOS, CKE, TRD, WR, TRD, RD, TWR, RD, TWR, WRSC and a couple of others. Now, as always, we started with the primary timings and then worked down from there. Personally, I tend to prioritize TRFC and TFAW for Act Window after the primaries, but a true expert on something like this would be maybe Buildzoid from actually our hardcore overclocking. Their Bauer is certainly very good as well. Uh, so we're not getting the absolute max possible performance you could get if you were, say, a, a memory overclocking expert like we'd consider Buildzoid to be, but we do a pretty good job where, call it maybe intermediate level overclocking, uh, and of course the six hours of effort just on each CPU. So that was the CPU memory tuning that we did. We worked on each of those, brought them down to their lowest possible values, and ran the frequency at the highest possible value while maintaining still good or good enough latency for all the timings. As for the stick configuration, we did a four by eight gigabyte Trident Z Neo for 
the AMD Ryzen 5600X platform. That's the kit that performed the best in some of our recent testing. It was a little bit ahead of our review kit, although not by much, but it did tune better. And we ran that at 3800 megahertz so that it could maintain one-to-one -one with the max F clock of 1900 megahertz. And for Intel, we ran the FC4000 kit from G-Skill as well. And that had, we ended up running it at 15, 15, 15 for all the primary timings and uh, then a, a 34. And then all those other timings that were just named were tuned for Intel as well. For the rest of the tuning, AMD and the 5600X for our unit is stable at 4.8 gigahertz all core, at least for these tests. And Intel for our unit is stable at 5.1 gigahertz for these tests. Sometimes we have to drop it to 5.0 and sometimes for the 5600 we have to drop it to 4.7, but that's for more enterprise-y tests. And for this, we really wanted to do just a true gaming battle between the two. So we chose the max possible numbers we could do for both while still maintaining good frame time consistency, uh, i.e. not an unstable overclock for at least these applications. With Intel, we tuned the cache ratio as well. That was brought up to 49X. We could almost hold 50, but it was starting to crash a little too much. So brought it down to 49, it was stable. Uh, only corrupted one operating system when tuning the memory, but once that was done, <laughs> we uh, cloned back, imaged back the OS, and picked it back up, got the memory timing stable as well for at least these benchmarks once again. And for F-Clock, if you're curious, uh, we did try the 5600X on the Asus Hero Dark. We tried it on the X570 Master, and we tried it on the MSI Godlike. And on all three of those, the F-Clock leveled out at the same spot. So we use the X570 Master, which is our standard board for all of our tests, and it seems to perform well with the memory for this one. A couple other quick notes here. For the 10600K tune, some of those voltages were really a little borderline on what we're comfortable with for long-term use. We wouldn't recommend copying our settings for this benchmark because it's meant to be sort of a, a battle royale. That sounds like it's 100 CPUs battling, which would also be cool. It's a head-to-head -head battle of the, the parts. So for the voltages we ran on the 10.6, again, a little bit on the uncomfortable side, but uh, we had a 1.55 dim, which is okay and 1.26 system agent. Not too happy about that system agent voltage, but I uh, needed it to get stability on everything. And then for the set voltage, we ran a level four LLC on the Asus motherboard. So that's kind of like a, a middle LLC level. It tends to overclock a little bit better, hold the overclock a little better. And a 1.45 volt set for core and cache, which drops down a little bit closer to 1.4 for get. For AMD, we ran the same voltages that we ran in the review, and those are plotted in the power benchmarks for the review of the 5600X, but it's about a 1.41 volt set, and for get voltage, that drops into the 1.3s. So uh, the LLC is what dictates how far it moves, of course. Let's get into the benchmarks and see how everything did. Shadow of the Tomb Raider will start us off, chosen because it had the highest impact from memory settings changes and recent testing. The AMD R5 5600X super tuned CPU, as we're calling it, although you could absolutely do more if you're more knowledgeable, like maybe Buildzoid or Der Bauer, but ours is nearly a chart topper now, falling behind only the R9 5950X at 4.7 gigahertz all core. The 5600X super tunes 211 FPS average result is consistently spaced compared to the 143 and 123 FPS 1% and 0.1% lows. The fact that these scaled so well demonstrates a stable overclock even in spite of all of the tuning, and shows that this is a valid configuration for testing. At 211 FPS average, the 5600X SuperTune outpaced the stock 5600X 196 FPS average by 7.9%, or the 4.8 GHz 5600X 200 FPS average by 6%. That's, that's a lot of numbers back to back. Hopefully that made sense. The 10600K is the real comparison. Stock, it did 165 FPS average, with lows at 116 and 99. These are all good numbers. Super tuning the 10.6 though, with a 5.1 gigahertz all-core OC, 49X cache ratio, and 4,000 megahertz RAM and tuned sub-timings, and SA voltages frankly high enough to make us uncomfortable for long-term use, we ended up at 193 FPS average. That's an impressive gain over the stock 17% for the 10.600K. So full credit to Intel for making such a scalable platform, but it's just still not enough here. That said, this is exactly why we liked the 10600K so much when it came out, because it's so tunable that you could turn it into a chart-topping CPU, even against the 10900K in a lot of gaming scenarios. They're so similar that until you find a game with a core difference, like Tomb Raider actually, it's hard to really justify a 10.9 
against the 10.6. Today though, we have perspective of the 5600X. The full stock 5600X is effectively tied or marginally outdoing the 10.6 while the super tuned 5600X outperforms it by 9.3%. So for those who were worried that we didn't give Intel enough of a chance by treating it unfairly and only tuning Intel, this is our response. It still loses. The division two is up now. In this one, the 5600X stock CPU did 244 FPS average in the review with the super tune at 254 FPS average and with lows proportionally behind. The configuration outperformed every single other item on the bench and is now a chart topper. Now, of course, we could apply equal effort to a 5950X or 5900X, and you'd likely see similar performance. It also outdoes the 4.7 GHz 5900X without a memory tune here, so the 56 tuned is doing pretty well. Compared to the 5600X at full stock settings, we improved by 4%, or only 1.6%, against the 4.8 GHz all-core OC. The 10600K stock CPU ran 206 FPS average in the review, improving with our so-called super tune by 8.7%, climbing to 224 FPS average and with lows at 146 and 119 FPS. The 5600X stock CPU maintains a 20 FPS average lead, or a 9% advantage, while the super tune holds a 13.5% lead. It's been amusing to see the opposite behavior. People used to complain that we didn't give Ryzen enough manual tuning effort when it didn't perform as well as Intel in games. And now we're seeing the opposite. People are complaining that we didn't tune Intel enough. But of course, you're supposed to leave the other one alone and not do any tuning at all for it when in these discussions. End of the day, you have to give equal effort to both to be fair. But the difference is that Intel can't reach even the stock 5600X when it's tuned heavily. Just like in generations previously, AMD's best CPUs couldn't reach Intel CPUs even when they were tuned heavily. In F1 2020, which is highly scalable, even approaching the 400 FPS range, the 5600X super tuned plotted at 344 FPS average, outdoing the original 4.8 GHz all-core OC's 330 FPS average by 4.3%, or the stock 5600X's 322 FPS average by 6.6%. The super tuned 5600X ends up right around the 5900X CPU's stock 346 FPS average with lows proportionally spaced. The stock 10600K did 267 FPS average here, which allowed the stock 5600X a lead of 29%. The super tuned 10600K did 318 FPS average, closing the gap, but still allowing the 5600X a lead. This does not change our recommendation that the 5600X simply makes more sense for a gaming build, at least right now, than the 10600K. That's despite, as well, the 10600K's extremely strong overclocking gains of 19% against its own stock performance. The 10900K might be able to pull ahead of the 5600X still with similar treatment to the 10600K here, but it's just so much more expensive that the comparison we think becomes irrelevant when what we're looking at originally is a price for price comparison. The next one is Total War Three Kingdoms and the Campaign Benchmark. There are two benchmarks we use for Total War Three Kingdoms. One is the Grand Campaign or Grand Strategy Campaign Map, and the other one is the Battle Benchmark, which has a lot of units on the screen. The 5600X with the Super Tune is the new chart topper here, and that makes sense. We've seen this in the past, where Total War, with certain benchmarks like this one, tends to respond more significantly to memory tuning than some other games. More recently, we observed this behavior in our 10600K Super Tune benchmark from earlier in the year. The 156 FPS average result puts the 5600X tune a bit ahead of the 4.8 GHz 5800X, or 8.7% ahead of the 5600X at just 4.8 GHz all core OC with no memory tuning. That's a big jump from an already overclocked line item. The 5600X ran at 135 FPS average, allowing the Super Tune a gain of 15.6% over stock. The Intel i5 10600K stock CPU plotted at 112 FPS average, improving to 132 FPS average when using the 4000 MHz memory and subtimings tune and increased cache and core ratios. That's an improvement of 17.5%, but it still allows the 5600X stock a lead and the 5600X Super Tune a lead of 19%. Up next is the battle benchmark for Three Kingdoms. The Super Tuned 5600X result runs 210 FPS average, an improvement over full stock of only 4.4%. There's not much changing in this version of the benchmark, so overall, this is one of the scenarios where if you were only playing this, it wouldn't really be worth the time or the money on, on higher end memory, but it just depends on what you're doing. The 10600K stock did 181 FPS average, with the Super Tune improving by 10% to 199 FPS average. That has it just below the R5 5600X stock CPU, so still not better. 
The equally tuned 5600X CPU maintains a lead of 5.5% here. Red Dead Redemption 2 has been the one stronghold game for Intel in all of our recent Zen 3 CPU reviews. So, we'll also revisit that one to see the inverse. If AMD is able to catch Intel, rather than the other way around for the previous game benchmarks. The 5600X Super Tune plotted 166 FPS average with lows at 93 and 82. The 10900K, for reference, ran at 177 FPS average. So that gives us an idea of the ceiling here. The original 5600X stock CPU did about 154 FPS average, meaning the tune improves performance by 8%. Originally, the 10600K stock CPU ran at 160 FPS average and held a lead of about 4.2% over the stock 5600X, although the all-core only OC on the 5600X did get it just ahead, barely. With memory tuning, the 10600K jumped to 173 FPS average for an improvement of 8.1%. That's enough to keep it in the lead, outdoing the 5600X tune by 4.2%. We found that most of our production and workstation tests we currently run aren't too responsive to this type of memory tuning. That doesn't mean that none are, just that we don't test any currently that show a response. We do test things that show a response from the all-core OC, but we already showed those numbers in the review, and they really don't change a lot of the time with uh, memory change only. So we'll look at compression, since it's the most likely in our current suite to show a change. The 5600X stock tune plotted at 69,000 MIPS, or millions of instructions per second, when we ran it for the review. The 4.8 GHz all-core OC pushed it to 72,000 MIPS, while the memory tune got it to 72.5 thousand MIPS. And this benchmark, out of all the production ones, has a fairly wide range of results, so there's really no change here. The 10600K stock CPU did 54,000 MIPS, while the tune got it up to 60.5 thousand MIPS. That's a big gain but not enough to make a dent in the lead held by the 5600X. So then, responding to a couple of the comments we saw, uh, so there, were, there was one video where someone mentioned that we were using, quote, extremely low frequency memory, and that's actually not true. So even though it's 3200 megahertz, one, not extremely low frequency, and two, the kit that we used, as you saw in our four versus two sticks test, the 3200, 14, 14, 14, one for the command rate, and then tuned sub-timings, that's like the best possible kit that we have right now that works on everything. So the numbers don't change that much. Going to the 3600 Trident Z Neo kit uh, from the 3200 CL14 with the timings tuned kit to get that out of the way. Secondly, for the couple of people who were complaining that we didn't give uh, Intel enough tuning effort, as a reminder, again, if you're going to tune one of them, like we've done for this, you really need to do it for the other one as well, otherwise it's just not fair. Because of course the answer is always, well, if you overclock that one, you can overclock the other one too. So if it's just sort of an arms race, then you gotta follow through with the arms race, not just do one half of the arms race. But either way, 10600K here, still losing for the most part. Red Dead Redemption 2 remains Intel's one strong point in the game suite that we currently test, and the 5600X remains really our primary recommendation right now for a gaming CPU. So going up to 59 or 5950 doesn't really make a lot of sense for gaming. They're so damn close. 5800X even is kind of a waste of money if you're only gaming. Emphasis on only gaming here. So 5600X strikes the best balance right now. Surely there will be a $200 AMD part at some point. We'll probably uh, that will probably usurp the recommendation from the 5600X once it comes out. It's, there's a good chance AMD held that part because its CPUs tend to all level out around the same spot. See the 3300X, for example. So that'll eventually happen, and we'll probably shift the recommendation. But for now, what's on the market today, 5600X, with all the tuning even, remains the better of the parts at $300. And the 10600K, uh, sadly for it, remains behind in most of these tests, if not all of them, depending on where you look at Red Dead. But yeah, so a lot of fun, but uh, even with heavy tuning, although Intel overclocks quote unquote better because it has more, it gains on average, it is not enough to put it in the lead. So that's it for this one. Lots of fun as always. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus and we'll see you all next time.